Denise Quinn, reading aloud for you for my short story, The Greasy Spoon, Chapter 50. Once out on the open road, he floors it. After a little while, Maria crawls up from the well and snuggles in next to him. He indulges in a moment's reverie. As a child, he'd taken such comfort from his parents' tremendous love for one another, and now that he's an adult, he marvels at it anew. He wonders if he'll ever experience such a great love for himself. Maria has reminded him of something his mother liked to do, sitting up close next to his dad whenever they went off-roading in the mountains of Tennessee on the odd weekend when they needed some time away. Blinks back the moisture in his eyes. He misses his folks. He bumps Maria's elbow and she looks up at him with shining eyes. Put on your seatbelt, he says. She gazes at him with confusion. Here. He digs his fingers between the crack of the torn leather seating and fumbles around for a bit through layers of dirt and grime and muck until his fingers touch something small and hard and he digs out the buckle. He reaches across her waist and grabs the lap belt. He pulls on the retractor to release the webbing and guides it across her waist and snaps the tongue into the buckle, then pulls it taut. There, he says, now you're safe. See, now I'm safe. She weeps for a few minutes, kisses his face several times, then rests her head on his right shoulder. The soothing rumble of the truck relaxes her. Her head grows heavy, her body warms, and she dozes off. Blue and red sirens race toward him from Parkersburg, heading for the farm. Ah, so the police have been alerted at last. He grabs a baseball cap off the dashboard. He's got his choice. There are plenty. Yanks the bill down low over his forehead and keeps his gaze steady and unflinching as a cacophony of sirens sweep past him. Good. And now that he and Maria are safe, he has the leisure to think on what's coming. There'll be an investigation. Oh, for sure, there'll be an investigation. A sobering thought. I might get charged with murder. Only, he's got a pretty good idea it'll get knocked down to justifiable homicide or perhaps even self-defense. He'd better lawyer up, though. That's for good and sure. He snorts with laughter. His lily-white wingtip shoe law firm handles only litigation and white-collar crime. But he's got a few friends from law school who practice criminal defense. I'll give Robbie a call. No, the criminal aspect of this case certainly doesn't appeal to him, but it also doesn't bother him too much. Not really. What does concern him is the Disciplinary Council of the Ohio Supreme Court. Now that does concern him. He runs through his responses to the inevitable questions. How could you abandon your friend? Well, he was dead, and I didn't want to be next. Why did you shoot Clem Alba when he clearly wasn't pointing a rifle at you? Now that's a tricky question. Clem hadn't pointed a gun at him, and who's to say the old guy couldn't have been talked out of shooting him? But Nick had had a choice to make, and he'd made it, and he had to live with it. And so his response to the lead counsel of the disciplinary council of the Supreme Court of Ohio would be along the lines of, well, you all weren't there, and I was, and I made a snap decision so you can all of you fuck the hell off. But still. 
questions, questions. There'd be lots of questions. Why didn't you stay at the farm to answer the police officer's questions? Because I didn't want to get shot by accident by some good old boy who was best friends with the family or a distant cousin. That's why I stopped later on that day at the State Highway Patrol and turned myself in. A fire truck screams past. He's getting closer to the village. Folks are paying attention at last. There'll be an investigation. Good and good and more good good. Why, there was goodness all around.